We are all here. All right, let us begin with prayer. We draw an eye unto thee, our Father in heaven, for thou dost invite us, thou dost tell us that there is free access unto thy throne of grace as we come in the name of thy beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We rejoice in him. We have from eternity been uh, loved by him. He has set his favor uh, upon us redemptively. And we thank thee now that we know ourselves by the testimony of thy spirit within us to be thy uh, children and that we are free to draw near and to call thee Abba Father, to make known unto thee the desires of our heart, to lay bare our weakness and our sin and our frailty and to look to thee for mercy. And so we do this day. We call upon thy name, show thyself to be unto us and to thy people the world round, to be our God, to be our Redeemer. Thou art the Lord of all, thou art the Creator, thou dost dispose of all of the affairs of men and of nations. And so we do commit our way to thee in confidence, lifting up before thee the, the needs and the mission of thy church as it is sent forth to proclaim Christ in the world. May the testimony of Jesus be attended by the power of thy spirit. May there be turning of multitudes uh, unto the, the, uh, the, the Savior of sinners. We thank thee for our part in this ministry, for our calling to go forth as ambassadors of Christ. Equip us, we pray thee for that. Forgive our sins, give us of thy spirit, the spirit of joy and of righteousness in the things of thy kingdom. For Jesus' sake, amen. Returning now to the subject of the uh, office of the prophet, we are trying to maintain the thesis that along with the general gift of prophecy, there was a specific office of the prophet in Israel. And uh, one way of uh, uh, showing that, we uh, dealt with the way in which the uh, covenant community, the Jewish people, were uh, <coughs> so much aware of this that they uh, used the, the, the matter of the office of the prophet as a, as a key determining factor in the organizing of the canon so that uh, the, the second section of the canon, the Nevi'im, former and latter prophets, uh, uh, the bounds of it were set in terms of uh, those books uh, that were authored by those who actually had the prophetic office. But then we moved on to the uh, exegetical uh, evidence and I ask you to turn back again now to Deuteronomy 18 with me and uh, we were seeing how in Deuteronomy 18 we have actually the, the, uh, the treaty covenant legislation that uh, uh, provided for this uh, particular office. As we noted, uh, uh, Deuteronomy 18 appears in the command uh, section of the treaty and more specifically within uh, that portion beginning <coughs> there, chapter 16, 17, 18, uh, that is dealing with the officers uh, of the, the theocracy, with the uh, well, with, with the judges, so with the priests, so with the king, and now in chapter 18, with the, the Navi, with uh, the uh, with, with the prophet of the Lord. And um, so we took up our reading of this uh, passage a few verses uh, before the actual mention of the Navi uh, to get the setting. And of course, the setting is uh, that the Israelites are. Uh, poised on the, the uh, banks of uh, the Jordan. They're about to uh, go over. It is the, the end of Moses' life. He is uh, setting things in order, and very specifically, the book of Deuteronomy is, uh, uh, has in view the, uh, the dynastic succession, as I call it. Uh, the, uh, the Moses is to be succeeded uh, uh, by Joshua. Moses is a distinct <coughs> figure and, as mediator of the covenant, and, and yet uh, uh, his uh, administrative and other, other covenantal uh, duties uh, can be carried on to an extent by, by others and in fact that is precisely then uh, we observe uh, what the uh, nature and the function of the prophet was to be such covenantal administrative successors of Moses. So we began our reading then just uh, we had uh, what verse we began with verse 9 we won't go through all of uh, that again, but it, it set the, the, the scene and uh, the, the provision of the prophet turns out to be something which will offset the, 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 the danger which uh, would, would face the Israelites uh, presently when they crossed the Jordan and encountered the Canaanite culture which was given to all manner of abominable 
means of consulting and uh, for oracles and so on. Uh, the, uh, the, the idolatrous type of thing that uh, to which can be attributed the fact God says that he was driving them out of uh, the land so uh, don't learn to do their ways uh, when you en enter uh, uh, the land uh, and uh, low Cain not so God says have I appointed for you but rather and now that brings us uh, uh, to the mention of the Navi in verse 15 so maybe we could at least just uh, uh, review from verse 15 on in our reading of uh, the Hebrew so uh, it begins there in Navi and what we have found already then was <coughs> that in, in, in setting forward this figure of the Navi God's counter provision over against the, that would obviate the need of uh, resorting and, uh, to the Canaanite or Acular devices this, this, this particular uh, figure is set forth and in doing so uh, Various uh, prerequisites or qualifications for the office are given, but the even uh, more uh, importantly, the, the the key nature of of, of this uh, prophetic office and its function emerges here as we uh, read what uh, follows the word Navi. So Navi, a prophet, and uh, he must be from the midst of you, from your brethren. We notice so there is a qualification. He must be from the covenant community. But then we emphasize the next word, kamoni, as Moses said, uh, the prophet, the Navi, is to be someone like me. Now there you have it. And if you uh, don't uh, get the implications of, of that, of the covenantal identification of the prophet, you uh, are going to be wandering around in your understanding of it, but you're going to be missing that which is uh, central uh, to the whole nature of, of uh, this prophetic office. It is one that is tied in with the, the covenant. They are administrators of God's covenant as uh, that covenant organizes the theocratic uh, uh, community. They are like unto Moses and uh, that is precisely what the, the nature of Moses was to be uh, this uh, covenant mediating figure. And more specifically then Moses goes on to uh, identify himself in terms of that covenant mediating uh, role that he played back at Horeb. Uh, that was the the matrix from which uh, then this whole covenant, uh, uh, this this whole prophetic office emerged. Kamoni, like unto me, Yahweh your God is going to, uh, will raise up on, onto you the direct divine appointment. We'll be emphasizing that in a moment as we analyze the, the various steps in the forming of the prophet, the matter of the direct divine uh, designation. And uh, uh, this one then, raised up like unto Moses as his authoritative uh, successor, this series of individuals actually, uh, unto him you will hearken. So uh, here is uh, the uh, responsibility of the covenant community to hear the authoritative words of God as they are going to be coming to them through these uh, prophets. Now we'll see that this language of unto him you will hearken uh, is picked up and echoed later on when when we're discussing uh, the, the individual fulfillment of this prophecy in the person of Jesus, the Messiah, right now we're looking at the corporate fulfillment, as we said, in the series of prophets, but there's also then the individual messianic prophecy. And when we look at the latter and we're looking for the evidence for it, we'll see how there is an echo of this particular requirement. Not to him you shall uh, hearken in connection with our Lord. Uh, for example, at the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Jesus is identified as this prophet when God echoes this, hear ye him, and Peter, James, and John and are, are, are told to hear him, Jesus, who is in their midst, who is this uh, prophet. Well, that's their responsibility. And then verse 16 and following, we, we saw, as I just said, how the, the, the origins of this are specifically traced back uh, to the Mount of Assembly, to the uh, covenanting uh, mountain at Sinai or, or Horeb, uh, where it turns out uh, that the, it was Israel's own request that triggered the provision of a, a prophet. So uh, verse uh, 16 says that, according to all of that which you yourselves then asked, Sha'alta, from with the, the Lord your God back at Horeb in the day of the assembly, when you said, and then we translated uh, the Loa Seifa, uh, not, not would I add uh, again to hear this call Yahweh, I don't want to hear any more uh, this thunderous uh, sound that they heard uh, coming from the top of the mountain as God addressed to Moses. Uh, the, the, this was too close up and personal uh, of, 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 of an encounter uh, uh, for them 
And so their request was that in the future there should be some distancing, there should be some bridging or medi mediation rather uh, between uh, the Lord and his speaking and the Israelites uh, themselves. So they don't wish anymore to hear the, the, the revelation of God in terms of the kol Yahweh, the, 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 the parousia thunder uh, of God's uh, voice. Uh, which is then also accompanied by the consuming fire uh, theophany and uh, that too they would uh, prefer not in, in the future to be seeing uh, why not well of course as they express it lest we die there's too much of an, the, the, the immediate presence of God constitutes uh, too uh, a serious a threat uh, to them as uh, sinners and so that's their thought and the verse 17 then and uh, going on now and uh, the Lord uh, said unto uh, it's unto me Eli Moses talking uh, the Lord then back there uh, when it, the Israelites made that request the, the Lord's reaction to, uh, to it was to say unto Moses unto me Etivu uh, asher deberu uh, literally, they have done well in that which they have spoken. They got a, they have a, they have a point there in which the, uh, the, they recognize the need for some distance between themselves and between the divine presence and and voice. The, the, they have a point there. The Lord is uh, prepared to comply with that, and His compliance then takes the forth form of the presence, uh, the, the provision of this uh, uh, navi. So they have done uh, well. And verse 18 now gives us the original uh, statement of the Lord uh, to Moses that we have already heard Moses quoting uh, to the people uh, when he said uh, a prophet uh, like unto me the Lord will raise up. Now we get the original statement uh, God to Moses a prophet like unto you. So uh, verse 18 and Navi Akim Lahem a prophet I will raise up unto them. We also have here the original from the midst of their Brethren, it's uh, and then of course instead of the kamoni, it's the kamoka, like unto you, Moses. The Lord says to him, like un unto you, and so uh, here again, at the place of covenanting, the mediator of the covenant is told that there will be those who will be followers of his in, in that covenantal uh, capacity, and uh, now further identifying, coming right to the. The, the heart of the formal basic function of, of the, the prophets when, uh, is uh, that they are the spokesmen hmm? in our analysis of the forming and functioning of the prophets the first point that we make under the functioning of the prophets is of course this basic formal thing that they are uh, the, the plenipotentiary spokesmen uh, for the covenant uh, uh, suzerain and uh, so the Lord proceeds to say that I will give my words in his mouth, in the mouth of the Navi, and he will speak unto them all of that which Atsawenu Piel, imperfect from Tsawa, which I will command him. Now there you you, you have a, a, a clear statement of the, the, the inspiration of uh, the prophets, the identification of their words with uh, the Lord's uh, words. People are afraid of the language of dictation theory in connection with inspiration and uh, nevertheless uh, you, the, the, there is this reality that uh, God puts his words in their mouths whatever uh, input there is of the, the uh, secondary agents the recipients of the revelation the ones who are going to speak it however uh, the, their own uh, character and background and circumstances and uh, language uh, experience uh, mold and, 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 and give shape to the uh, inspired word. It, uh, it remains God's words uh, that uh, have been put in uh, their mouth and which they speak and therefore the, the full authority of it that demands you shall hearken uh, unto him. So in, in this brief account of the, the prophet we get some very basic things as to what the nature of the office was and what the basic uh, function of it was covenantal office, spokesman, and then it simply becomes a matter of tying those two things together and seeing how their spoken message uh, was uh, uh, geared into uh, the covenant realities in one way or another. Now then, having described the, the true prophet, the good prophet that God will 
face up. Uh, he, the Lord anticipates for them a, a problem that's going to uh, arise that uh, there will be false prophets. And so there will be not only the danger of, of, of falling into the trap of the uh, Canaanite uh, soothsaying uh, uh, techniques, but right within the, their own ranks there will be then this phenomenon. Satan is busy outside, he's busy within the covenant community, and uh, within the covenant community he will be raising up those who are speaking his lying words and even performing his de de deceiving wonders in, in their midst. And, uh, that will constitute then a problem of identification. How are we going to know a true prophet from a, a uh, false prophet? So that's the problem that's addressed then in um, verse, uh, where we just finished uh, 18, <coughs> in verse uh, 19 now, in verse 19. So it shall be, Yes, I, I guess we finished 18. And the like unto, uh, I will raise up, and in his mouth I will command uh, 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 all that which I command. Right, okay, now verse 19. And uh, it shall be that the each, the one who does not hearken unto, oh, um, he hasn't gotten to the false prophet uh, problem yet, it's continuing with, uh, uh, with uh, un underscoring the necessity of of heeding the true prophets still here in verse 19. It shall be that the, the one, the, the Israelite, uh, who does not hearken unto my words, which he will speak in my name, uh, I, I will uh, hold him responsible. I, I will require it. Uh, I will seek it from him. I will, I will re require of it him. This will not be something you can do with impunity. It will be something which is subject to the divine scrutiny. And when he speaks, he, he demands attention. He demands uh, heeding. And uh, so if there is a failure to have the proper response, uh, you may expect that there will be uh, an accounting. And uh, so this whole phenomenon of prophecy is one which uh, involves uh, the thought of uh, immediate responsibility and future accountability. Uh, prophecy is not a phenomenon that is provided to satisfy idle curiosity. Uh, it is uh, in intensely a religious matter, a matter of covenantal behavior. Uh, and so as I say, it, it emphasizes the, the, the immediate response that you are responsible for, that, that idea. Uh, and with a view that there are the, the sanctions of the covenant. Huh? The treaty form involves the, the, the commandments there in the third section, but then the, the final section there are also the, the curses and the blessings. There's immediate uh, duty and there is a future judgment uh, in, in the covenant life. I will require, I will, will hold him responsible. There, there, there will be a, a, a dealing with him. Now, if that's the case, uh, then we must uh, know what is the true word of God and what is not the, the true word of God. And uh, now it's in verse 20 that we uh, come to uh, that particular matter. Surely the Navi, Asher Yazid, uh, from the, the hollow verb, Zu, the Zid, and, uh, and uh, this form could be either a cow or a hip field. It's usually parsed as a, a hip field. Uh, surely the, the prophet uh, who shall... Uh, uh, presume, the idea of boiling up, presuming uh, to speak a, a davar, me a, a word in my name, which God hasn't spoken. So here's a phony. Uh, he, he comes and, and th this is what makes his identification as a false prophet all the more difficult. He comes in God's own name. Uh, and he speaks a word in, in my name, which I have not commanded him, CWT, PL, perfect form there of Sawa, which I have not commanded him to speak. And now here, here's another category. You get two categories in uh, verse 20. The first one, the one who comes in the name of God uh, and uh, yet uh, is making up a message which uh, uh, the Lord hasn't provided him. Then there's the other possibility, uh, is uh, that uh, someone comes in the name of uh, other gods, and he goes on to say that. Or 
which will speak Beshem Elohim Acherim in the name of other gods, and that prophet shall die. So um, here then we have these uh, two possibilities of false prophets, the one speaking in God's name, the one speaking in the name of other gods, but in either case, if it is a message which God hasn't uh, uh, himself delivered, uh, then the, the penalty is uh, for the false prophet himself, uh, very uh, uh, severe indeed. Now then, verse 21 uh, uh, addresses itself to the first of those options uh, that uh, we saw in verse 20, the one that someone comes in the name of God himself. And that, after all, is the more difficult one, I suppose, is it not? If, the, if someone comes in the name of uh, other gods, he gives himself away right at, at once, and obviously you're not going to be following him. Uh, that, that would be rebellion against uh, the, the, the Lord. But now the, the, the trickier one is that first one, when he comes in the name of the Lord. And so verse 21 raises that obvious question uh, in this form. And Moses, Moses says to the people, if now you, you, you say in your heart, if, if, if this problem uh, uh, occurs to you, if you are saying in your heart, how in the world uh, are we supposed to know? Hmm? How are we to know the word which the Lord has not spoken if they come and say, speak in, in God's name? And then the answer comes back. Uh, it, the, the test is going to be uh, the fulfillment of the verifiable prophecies, huh? uh, or the, the failure to, uh, uh, of, of the verifiable prophecy uh, to, be, uh, uh, to come to pass. And so verse 22 says, when the prophet speaks B'Shem Yahweh in the name of the Lord, this is the, the uh, first tw verse 20a, the problem raised there, in the name of the Lord, we lo yeah, and it is not, but just literally, and, and the davar is not, which is then further uh, described by the words we lo yavo, it, it doesn't come. So the, the, the prophecy remains unfulfilled. It, it, it isn't realized. It, it doesn't come uh, to pass. And, and in that case, that is the, the word which Yahweh has not spoken. Uh, and uh, the, the verdict as far as the false prophet as he is as uh, concerned is bizadon uh, in, uh, in presumption. Hmm? It's the noun from uh, the verb we just uh, had to, to act presumptuously. In, in presumption, he has the, the prophet has spoken it, and therefore not shall you fear him, not shall you reverence him, not shall you give heed uh, unto him, is, uh, is the, the thought tagur to, uh, uh, to fear. So um, the, the, that's the test. If the, he comes speaking in the name of other gods, all right, you know that's a false prophet. But if he comes in the name uh, of the Lord, now not all prophets are immediately uh, verifiable. Hmm? Uh, but if someone comes uh, with a message which has to do with the, the relatively uh, near the future, and, and then you can see how it falls out one way or the, the other, uh, the, the, that's the, the, the test that the Lord provides. I suppose if someone prophesies that uh, in 10,000 years such and such is going to happen, then it's a little while you have to wait to see if it's <laughs> genuine. That's, and so that's why I underscore the word verifiable. Huh? So the, the, the test of the true prophet is the fulfillment of, of his verifiable um, uh, prophecies. Now while we're dealing with this, uh, let's uh, flip back to chapter 13, <coughs> where the uh, same problem uh, is, uh, Deuteronomy 13, where the same problem has uh, previously been addressed. <coughs> And we can begin with the second verse there, Deuteronomy uh, 13. Ki yakum v'kirvakah navi, o cholim halom. So if or when uh, there shall arise in your midst a navi, or a cholim halom, a dreamer of dreams, another of these verb and cognate nouns and objects, 
and he gives unto you ot o mofet, ot o mofet, a sign or a wonder. Now that language can be used uh, for you know some physical uh, uh, outward e e uh, spectacular event, or it, it uh, can be used in, in the sense of a, a prophetic sign, a prophetic word that is uh, spoken and that uh, might be fulfilled or not to fulfill a sign or a wonder in that sense. So someone comes to, to you and uh, he uh, performs a, a lines, a sign or a wonder, in, including there, there could be therefore the, the fulfillment of a verifiable prophecy on, on his part. And as it goes on to say, verse uh, 3, and the sign or the wonder Va comes. Now we, we just had the opposite to describe a prophecy that failed. Yeah, yeah, it, lo, yeah, yeah, it, it is not. And then you use the same word, bo, with a negative. It doesn't come to pass. Now here's the positive side. This thing does come to pass. This, this verifiable prophecy is, is fulfilled. Now you have a real problem on, on your hands. You're confronted with this, uh, with uh, something spectacular and uh, that impresses you. It's, it's a word, and lo and behold, it, it comes to true. However, then you get this uh, further statement, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, which he spoke unto you, saying at the same time, Ahre, let us go after other gods. So here you see you have that second category that you had in Deuteronomy uh, 18, verse uh, 20, the, the second category where someone comes to you in the name of other gods. That's that option had already been treated, you see, back mm -hmm. here in chapter 13, and that's one of the reasons why in chapter 18 you didn't have to pick up on that. You only picked up in verse 21 on the first option in verse 20, namely someone who comes in the name of God. Now here is that second option, uh, and, uh, and and so here they are already told how to uh, handle that. He comes to you, uh, his sign is fulfilled, and, and yet the, the context of that was that he had solicited to them to uh, idolatrous or worship, saying, let us go after other gods which you haven't known and you haven't served. They, they, they and their fathers have known and, and in the, the covenant and, and been serving uh, the Lord, and, and this is someone else that they are now encouraged to, to follow. Well, in that case, of course, uh, then in spite of uh, how impressive the fulfilled prophecy is, uh, the, of course, the, their duty is, is to resist this satanic lying sign and wonder. It is a sign and a wonder, but it is one that, that is uh, uh, contributing to support above uh, the lie of Satan and, uh, and the, the blasphemy against uh, God. So not shall, verse 4, not shall you hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. Uh, what is happening in that situation is that the Lord is, is testing the obedience uh, of his uh, uh, people in, in this uh, way that requires of them uh, that to uh, adhere strictly to their allegiance to the Lord in spite of uh, the oppressiveness of the counter signs. Uh, for he says, Minaseh, PL participle, the Lord is, is, is your God is testing you, Lada'at, to know, Hayishkem, that's the interrogative particle, Yesh, there is in Kem, the pronominal suffix, in order that the Lord might know whether you are, Hayishkem, whether you are, Ochavim, loving. Yahweh, your God, and of course that word ahav, love, with its, uh, its uh, distinctive covenantal significance of, uh, of, uh, of faithful allegiance uh, to the Lord of the covenant uh, uh, is uh, the, the force of it. And uh, whether you are loving the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. And verse 5, after Yahweh, your God, you shall go and him you shall fear, and his commandments you shall observe, and unto his voice you shall, there's that verb shama, and you shall hearken, and uh, unto him, uh, and him you shall serve, and unto him, and then the verb davak is, uh, is another one of those distinctive covenantal terms to cling unto, to cleave uh, 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 unto, 
So uh, this is uh, the, their constant fundamental covenantal uh, duty from which they are not to uh, be misled even by lying uh, signs and, and wonders. And then returning to this business of the false prophet, verse 6, and that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, you mutt. Now this one is the passive, this is the hafal form. He shall be put to, to death. Uh, in, in the other passage in Deuteronomy 18, it was saying, and, and, and he shall die. But then uh, here the, the judicial execution aspect of it comes out. He shall be put to, to death as a punitive act. Uh, for he has spoken rebellion against Yahweh your God, the one who brought you forth from uh, the land of uh, Egypt and who redeemed you from uh, the, and here you get that historical prologue of language uh, from the covenant treaties, from the house of bondage. And uh, now, uh, at this point in, 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 in reading uh, that verse, you have to be a little careful. After, after it dis it's been describing the Lord as the one who who redeems you from the house of bondage and, and so on. But after Avadim, uh, now it is uh, returning to uh, the, the, the false prophet. The false prophet is uh, then saying this in order to lead you astray. He'll feel from Nadan. Huh? To lead you astray from the way which the Lord your God has uh, commanded uh, you to walk in it. And uh, by then having this false <coughs> prophet put to death, uh, the, the evil will be consumed from your midst. So there, there it is a very full treatment then of the uh, problem of the one who comes in the name of other gods with the impressive signs that he is performing, but yet obviously uh, he has given himself away right from the outset and uh, he is to be e executed. So that one was part of the background and coming back now and then again to Deuteronomy 18, as I say, there was no need then to develop the thought of the treatment of that kind of false prophet to here in verses 20 and 21, but it, it does develop further now the problem of the one who speaks in the name of God. And there then, uh, I repeat, uh, the, the, the test uh, is the fulfillment or failure to be fulfilled of the verifiable uh, prophecies. Now then, that seems to imply, you're putting uh, those two passages together, that uh, seems to uh, in involve a commitment on God's part that he would never put his people in, in the position where a false prophet would come speaking in the name of God and also having his uh, uh, prophecies fulfilled. So the, the, it is not stated that, that, that explicitly, but that, that seems to be the, the assumption that's necessary to make these other uh, tests uh, are workable. I say again, then, that the Lord would never put his people in the position uh, where a, someone who was a false prophet would uh, come speaking in God's name and also then that the Lord would would uh, uh, honor that uh, to have his uh, prophecy fulfilled. So if those two things are true, it comes in God's name and the sign of the, the, and the, the, uh, the, the prophecy, the verifiable prophecy is fulfilled, uh, then, then you may safely assume that this is uh, God's true spokesman and uh, then you better heed uh, him. And as we were saying then, this fact that they must be dealing with the reality of a succession of, of false prophets, uh, of course, confirms our corporate understanding of the Navi that this does have to do uh, not just with the, the single figure of the Messiah in the future, but it has to do with this whole corporate uh, series of uh, successors of Moses, the Navi figures like unto to him. Any points uh, yeah, here we far. Now, speak, speaking then of the uh, of the messianic form, and let's just turn while we're at this and and and, uh, and say a bit about that uh, in order to. Uh, you know, validate that as, as a proper interpretation along with the, the corporate one. Uh, so what we're saying then that, that here is a concept, the Navi figure, uh, which is a messianic uh, uh, designation and, and yet at the same time uh, has, has a corporate uh, uh, fulfillment uh, again. Now this doesn't surprise us, does it? 
because from uh, early Genesis on, from the earliest messianic prophecy in Genesis 3 on, we have encountered this very phenomenon of, of particular messianic designations or figures uh, uh, having an individual at the same time a corporate fulfillment starting already with the seed of the woman now. So there is uh, the already there in Genesis 3.15 the individual messianic champion who will uh, come from the woman but at the same time there's the whole uh, company of, of those uh, who are the, the elect sharing the faith of Mother Eve is over against the seed of the serpent and so on and so from that point on we, we keep encountering this phenomenon of individual hyphen corporate fulfillments and uh, the, again with the seed of Abraham uh, the, the same thing is uh, true and uh, and uh, repeatedly the, the son of David is an individual messiah, but it's also the whole dynasty of, of uh, David and uh, the whole problem of the Eved Yahweh that you are paying particular attention to in your uh, reading and so on. Uh, and th th that's a major question there, isn't it? Who is the Eved Yahweh? Is the, the, this Israel, Israel corporately, or, or uh, some elect within the, uh, Israel corporately? Uh, or, or is it the individual Messiah, or, or is it uh, uh, both? And, uh, and uh, there are others, including then the, 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 the famous son of man problem in, the, in, uh, in Daniel, and uh, the, there too, uh, I think the case can be made out that uh, obviously the son of man refers to uh, our Lord. We'll deal with this again when we come, I trust, later on to the book of Daniel in the course. Uh, it, uh, it obviously refers to Jesus, one of his favorite self-designations. Uh, and yet when you read the, the, the chapter itself in Daniel 7 and, and where the angel is interpreting the, the uh, language of, of, of the vision that, that Daniel, uh, where the vision says that the Son of Man will receive the, the kingdom, the interpretation says that the saints of the Most High will receive uh, the, the king. So re all I'm saying then is that, that the Navi figure here in Deuteronomy 18 fits into a pattern uh, all through Messianic prophecy where uh, you have both and rather than either or type of uh, choice. But uh, now then what uh, leads us to say then that in Deuteronomy 18 that this Navi does in fact uh, refer to uh, to Jesus the, the, uh, the Christ and for this uh, purpose, maybe I can abbreviate what otherwise I might run along saying by uh, just reading what I have said about it uh, in, well, maybe two places. One is Images of the Spirit, uh, page 81 and 82. I refer more briefly to it, and it's a little longer treatment in, <coughs> you'll look at in a second, in the structure of biblical authority, but. Uh, Pages 81 and 82. Uh, in, in these two passages, I, uh, I'm dealing then with this question. In both of them, I, as I recall, I, I, I bring in the, the evidence of uh, the, the Isianic servant of, of uh, the, the Lord. And as a matter of fact, uh, what I've written in, in these two passages is pretty much the nupius. You know, I mentioned uh, Gordon Hugenberger's article, which is uh, excellent, and I, I, I think you should be reading in connection with that whole, whole matter. And the, the, that is a, an excellent expansion of the, the essential ideas then that I've got in these two places. Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 22, defining prophet in terms of Moses as paradigm provides the constitutional basis for the Old Testament covenantal office of the prophet. Now that's what we've been saying so far. Then however, but because of the typological nature of Israel's theocratic officers, they point beyond themselves to their messianic antitypes. So just in themselves, these phenomenon of the, the Old Testament officers, prophet, priest, and king, are part of a typology so that inherent in their very meaning is this prophetic pointing of the head uh, to the one who is the, their antitype. Uh, and hence the constitutional provision of Deuteronomy 18 for the succession of the Old Testament prophets is also a promise of the ultimate individual prophet of the new covenant. And now in agreement with the, the, that, uh, for one thing, Peter affirmed that Jesus was this prophet like unto Moses. 
Acts 322 and following. The, uh, the apostle had grasped the significance of the event of Jesus' transfiguration, recognizing it as a counterpart to Moses' experience under the overshadowing glory cloud of si at Sinai. In the command of the voice from heaven at the transfiguration, namely, hear him, the voice that came out of the glory cloud, hear him, Peter perceived the ultimate application <coughs> of the Deuteronomic requirement that Israel obey God's prophet, Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. So th that voice at the transfiguration event was God's own identification of Jesus as the prophet like unto Moses. The pattern set by Moses was fully matched and more than that in Jesus. For like Moses, Jesus is prophet mediator of the covenant not only in the sense of performing the function of authoritative spokesman in the ongoing covenantal administration, but he was also mediator of the covenant in its inauguration. So not just like the other prophets who succeeded Moses, but Jesus, like Moses, was a mediator of the covenant at the inauguration of, uh, of the uh, covenant. An intermediate connection in biblical revelation between Moses and Jesus. Jesus, the fulfillment of the prophet paradigm, and an intermediate connection is the Isianic servant of the Lord. For on the one hand, in speaking of the servant, the prophet spoke of Christ, and on the other, Isaiah portrays that servant as a new Moses prophet. So uh, the servant is Christ, but the servant is also this Navi, like unto Moses and uh, some of the details that bring that out. The servant is raised up by the elective call, the uh, parallels to the Navi, you see. The servant is raised up by the elective call of God and spirit endowed. He is cognizant of the divine counsel. He's made an effective mouth of, for the Lord. He is a mediator of the redemptive covenant and fulfillment of covenantal promises of deliverance and kingdom inheritance through righteous judgment. And all of these then are features of the forming and the functioning of the Navi, as, uh, uh, as we will see. And uh, we'll maybe some repetition, but uh, let's, uh, in, in the structure of biblical authority on that, in the, in the second edition, then there was that new chapter that was added at, at the end on the Old Testament origins of the gospel genre. Uh, rather shortly, and we'll be dealing with passages in the uh, book of Numbers where we'll have occasion to come back to uh, some material in this uh, article. But right now, um, page 190, if you want to look it up at your leisure then. Oh, here it is. Dealt with this same thing that I had dealt with in uh, images of the, the, the spirit. And... Um, It's part of an extensive treatment of, of the Moses typology in uh, the, the Gospels treatment uh, of our Lord. So as uh, the, the Gospels are painting the, the picture of, of who Jesus is, uh, that they, they do that in, in a striking way for one thing, uh, by this Moses parallelism, this Moses typology, and it's a, it's a, no, it's a fascinating and important thing in how in many ways this is the case of what I'm, uh, in this particular chapter is, uh, is the, the key point I'm trying to demonstrate is uh, the nature of the book of Exodus uh, uh, when we're trying to determine the origins of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, they, that's the, the Gospel genre. Where did it uh, emerge? Uh, was it uh, something that was created just uh, at that point in, in history uh, in order to provide the revelation of, of, of the, the Messiah? Or were there antecedents, literary antecedents of, of that particular uh, genre? And uh, so I'm trying to make the, the case uh, 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 in, in this particular chapter that the, the book of Exodus uh, is, is the gospel of Moses and that is basic 
structure and its basic function is the same as the New Testament Gospels and uh, just to state the main point, namely that in each case we're dealing with documents that, that are covenantal witnesses. Now that's the purpose of the Gospels, that was the purpose of the book of uh, Exodus, that they, they are attesting to the fact that God has, uh, has made covenant and uh, so they are accounts of of the inauguration and the ratification of the covenant. That's what a New Testament gospel basically is. And, uh, and that's what the book of Exodus is. As, and uh, as you can see from looking at, the, at the, the, the last half of one of the four New Testament gospels, which uh, are an account of the passion of Jesus, the shedding of the blood of the covenant, the inauguration of the covenant. That's the climax of each gospel. That's the fundamental purpose of each gospel of the Lord pointing to, attesting to the fact he has made covenant in the blood of the Lamb with his people. And then that's the same thing in the book of Exodus from 19 uh, chapter on is the account of God's covenanting, making the, the old covenant uh, uh, with Israel. And then in each case, uh, the rest of the, the document, whether Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or Exodus, the rest of the document is uh, is uh, uh, presenting to you the figure who is the mediator of that covenant, uh, which the latter part uh, uh, gives the account of. In the one case, of course, Jesus, and the other case, Moses. So it's in connection with that broader literary documentary uh, thesis uh, that the parallelism then between uh, Jesus and, and, and Moses becomes especially relevant, and, and I'm trying to develop that at great length, and including then this point uh, concerning the uh, Jesus and his relationship to Moses as the paradigm Navi figure. And uh, Jesus' identity as the prophet like unto Moses affirmed by, by Peter is reflected in the Gospels, and here I mentioned, uh, and you might like to note, uh, look up in detail, uh, John 5.43 is relevant, and also John 12.48 and following, and Matthew 17.5 is reflected in the Gospels and the prophetic role of Moses was precisely his role as mediator of the covenant. The prophetic legislative passage in the Deuteronomic Treaty that instituted the office of the prophet defines it as a continuation of the function of Moses at the Sinai covenant making. So perhaps our reading of this can at least serve that as a summary and gathering together of what we've been trying to cover the last few hours. Um, the prophets of the Old Covenant, down to John the Forerunner, and by the way, that's the last chapter in the history of the prophets. When we give a little short history of the matter, that's where we end up, of course, is with, with the John the Forerunner of Jesus as the last of these Old Covenant prophets. So down unto, to him, uh, the uh, they were thus primarily covenant messengers, all of them, like unto Moses, as uh, channels of covenant revelation and as agents of covenant administration. But Jesus Christ was the prophet like unto Moses in the full sense, that he was the mediator prophet at the inauguration of the covenant and the establishment of the kingdom. John, in his gospel, stresses the uniqueness of the prophetic vision of the Son. Only he has seen the Father. But even here, John may be alluding comparatively to the special intimacy of the vision of God enjoyed by Moses beyond others in the old economy. So even when painting the contrast between Jesus and Moses, there's a, a note here that brings out the, the parallelism in, in terms of this, this uh, uh, superior intimacy of, of the Mosaic revelation, a point then that we'll uh, look at Numbers 12 to bring out uh, uh, our next hours uh, together. Uh, certainly the transfiguration narrative in the synoptics contains an impressive set of analogs to the experience of Moses, the prophet mediator at Sinai. The covenantal perspective is manifested by the presence of Moses and also of Elijah, whose ministry of covenant renewal recapitulated so strikingly various episodes in the life of Moses, that is, Elijah's did. The transfiguration transpired on the mountain enveloped by the theophanic glory cloud. Was it perhaps in part because Peter was so much under the impression of the similarity of it all uh, to the Sinai event, which had issued in the establishing of God's tabernacle among his people, that Peter, still not sufficiently minding the things of God, 
came up with the suggestion that the transfiguration occasion might immediately have a similar outcome, as though Pentecost might come before Jesus had accomplished his uh, exodus, and so he suggests they're setting up tabernacles, perhaps because he's aware of the parallelism and the same, this should have the same outcome as uh, the, the other. The voice from heaven commanding him, hear him, uh, echoed Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, so designating Jesus as the Moses-like prophet invested with oracular authority. And the glory shining from the face of the transfigured Jesus was manifestly the transcendent counterpart to the reflection of the glory of the Shekinah that was seen in the face of Moses after he had been in the Mount of the Covenant. So the whole episode then is... Uh, is redolent of, of the experience of uh, Moses at Sinai and serves to identify Jesus as that Nabi like unto Moses. Let's see here. Also relevant to the Gospels, Moses mediator typology is the identification of Jesus in the Gospels as the Isianic servant of the Lord, that matter again. For it was the figure of Moses, the servant of Yahweh in the founding of the Sinaitic covenant that Isaiah drew upon in forming the figure of the servant whom God would give as the, the covenant of, of the people, although that will suffice, but there are all of those interesting biblical theological connections uh, then uh, that I think uh, you know, clearly justify our understanding the Navi of Deuteronomy 18, not simply in the corporate sense, but uh, in the sense of the individual uh, messianic uh, anti-type. Well, now then, looking at what we've tried to do in terms of Deuteronomy 18 and uh, the, the, the office of the prophet, we have seen then that there is this evidence that, that there, there was not only a general charismatic gift of prophecy, but uh, that, that this was uh, a, a feature of certain ones who actually developed an authoritative uh, uh, theocratic office, uh, matter of covenantal administration like unto Moses. And uh, now then what we want to proceed to do is of course then to study this office as to its uh, nature and uh, here I uh, don't know if you, I haven't given you an outline, uh, let, let me uh, dictate to you an outline now of uh, what we'll be doing for the next little bit. There'll be two main headings, this analysis of the prophetic office in, in Israel. There'll be two main headings. The first is the forming of the prophet, and under that three points, A, B, C, and then there will be the, the functioning of the prophet. Under the forming of the prophet, the, the first matter is uh, the, the divine appointment. And by the way, these three things, though distinguishable, are uh, are not separable, they're, they're all part of uh, one prophetic experience. But the first point then is that this experience that the prophets had was by way of expressing God's uh, appointment of them. So divine appointment uh, are the terms for the, the divine election, the divine call, the divine certification, the, 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 the designation, whatever term, but it's, uh, it's uh, God, in terms of Deuteronomy 18, it's uh, that God says, the Lord will raise him up unto you, the divine appointment. This appointment is registered in connection with uh, a, a heavenly experience, an, an ecstatic catching up into the, the uh, presence of God in the heavenly court in the midst of uh, the Lord and his elect angels and, and the, the heavenly council. Uh, and just think right away of Isaiah 6 and, and his call, and uh, that's where he is. And so the call comes to him in, in this, uh, well, Paul had a similar experience and couldn't tell us whether he was in the body or out of the body, so I guess we better remain agnostic on the point too. But it is that they are caught up uh, in, into the presence of, of God uh, on, on this occasion. And this whole reality of that heavenly presence of God, that upper register, if you will, uh, is uh, the realm of the spirit. And, uh, and uh, therefore the phenomenon of the prophetic call and, and so on 
it also features uh, a, a special relationship of the Spirit coming upon the prophet to qualify him uh, for office. And, and, and that relationship can be expressed and is expressed in the Bible in a whole variety of, of uh, ways. And uh, we can call it uh, uh, possession, anointing, investiture, whatever. But it is a, the, the coming of, of the, the spirit of, of that heavenly reality upon the prophet uh, so as to take possession of him and to qualify him and to uh, anoint him in terms of his function as spokesman to inspire him. But it's, uh, it's uh, the, the special uh, um, spiritual, uh, it's a spirit relationship uh, uh, that's uh, important to the forming of the prophet. And then the other and uh, let me just finish the outline before I let you go here. Uh, the, the next uh, heading will be the functioning of the prophet. And it too will have uh, three subheads, A, B, C, the second of which I will uh, develop a little bit more. But under the functioning of the prophet, A, the, the, the basic thing we've mentioned, he's the spokesman. Huh? I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak uh, this. So the, the, the function of being the the, the, the sent one, he's an apostle, huh? that they are, they are caught up as part of their call into the heavenly reality. They hear the word of God, and uh, then they are sent back to earth. Hmm? And so they are sent ones, they are apostles, and uh, they are apostles who have a, a mission as messengers. So they are uh, uh, apostle messengers, or spokesmen, authoritative spokesmen. Now, the next point in B, gets us into the whole heart and core and substance of, of the, the, the course and, and the analysis of the prophets. And, and uh, they are spokesmen, and then we can identify their work in terms of their two audiences. And B is their mission to Israel, and uh, then C will be their mission to the nations. And so in their mission to Israel, and that's the one that we develop most uh, Everything will depend uh, on, on one's overall covenantal analysis and to see that the prophets are relating on the one hand to the Mosaic covenant, on the other hand to the basic uh, covenant of, of grace and the Abrahamic covenant and so on. And so in terms of their relationship to the Mosaic covenant, the, the, the prophets have the task of prosecuting the lawsuit. In terms of the Abrahamic covenant, uh, they have the task of, uh, of echoing, continuing, reinforcing uh, the promises of the Abrahamic covenant to do which is to, to be heralds of, of the new covenant. So in, in the, the, those two uh, aspects of their mission to Israel, we have the, the bulk of what we'll be talking about as we were saying before. One leads to the fall of Israel, the other leads to the fullness of Israel. Then finally the mission to the nations, uh, which essentially involves the, the same two notes. Uh, there are prophecies of judgment, there are prophecies of uh, salvation. Yes, please. Under forming, I have divine appointment, and then, then nothing to be. The, then the, the the experience in the divine council, and third, the spirit possession. Okay. So today, then, uh, uh, exceptionally, uh, as it turns out, we'll be meeting only the one hour today. But from uh, uh, here on out, as I said, uh, for quite a while, we better count on two hours on, uh, on Wednesdays.